development. And I specifically cover uh, basically our AI technology uh, around bots and really cognitive services. Had a kind of a funny uh, morning. Um, evidently, there was an agenda that was sent later that was revised. <laughs> and so the original agenda had me coming on at 2.45. So I'm like, yeah, just I'll get there early and make sure I'm ready. I walk in, they're like, yeah, you're on. Like, oh, oh, dear. Um, I'm actually, I drove down from Windsor this morning. So um, thanks for having me. Looking forward to um, talking to you guys about some of this technology. It's pretty cool. So what I'd like to start with is just <clears throat> talking about some of Microsoft's AI platform. I'm going to turn this down just a little bit. There we go. Is that better? So I'm not breathing in it. Yeah, no, that one too, huh? Um, yeah, I, sh I should be. Let me try. Just double check that. How's that? I think we're good now. Thanks. Yep. So, <clears throat> when we talk about conversations platforms, so we're going to talk about bots and cognitive services, but just in, in general, our AI platforms. I love this picture. This is actually from uh, two years ago, um, 2016 in March, when our CEO, Satya, kind of land, launched this idea of, of conversations as a platform. Now, this isn't just bots, and that's one of the biggest keys I want you to take away today. We're going to talk a lot about bots and kind of the bot framework, bot technology, but it's more than just that, okay? And that's really one of the keys just to start with. So this is actually, the next slide here is more about, um, you know, basically this is just released uh, last January. So we're still talking about the same things, but we're getting a much kind of uh, more advanced into our AI platforms and what we can do with them and how, how far things have come since that first 2016 release. So let's talk about how important this is to Microsoft. Um, this is actually from our last uh, annual report. So not only are we just talking about bots, we're also talking about applications and infusing AI in those apps. So in my mind, the next couple of things that we're gonna see is just really some of the things that we're seeing in the marketplace for conversational agents and where those are going and how they can help businesses, how they can help you with your customers and how you can help them with uh, your employees. But the key here for me is that in my mind, it's really, you think about when you're developing software, I've been a software developer almost 20 years. We've, the software engineer has been one of the, one of the main release points for software. Uh, that makes sense, right? DevOps has really come along to help us with that, right? Make things faster, make things more reliable when we release things. Well, in my mind, AI is on the other side of that. So if you think about DevOps being on one side where the software engineers releasing things quickly, AI can help you with your systems and your applications to make those smart enough that where you don't need a new release. So if you have both of those, your applications really start getting phenomenal in terms of what they can do and how they can do it. So we're going to talk about a couple areas that we see. It's a conversational agents, obviously bots. Um, it's kind of funny. We get a, we've been doing a lot of uh, shows and customer interactions with bots. And I always like the question when we get into certain um, customers where they say, they ask the bot, are you a bot? I think that's really cool because you're getting to the point where bots are so conversational and they're doing such a good job that you can't tell sometimes. I don't know if that's a good thing on the human side or if it's a bad thing on the, or on the good thing on the bot side. Either way. Um, so 95% of our interactions that we see is, and we see this a ton in like internal applications, external applications. You, hopefully you guys have been seeing it as well. The next thing is really intelligent apps. This is really exciting for me um, because you really, this is kind of the, the um, where the rubber meets the road for that, that concept of DevOps and AI coming together to make these applications really smart and really to be able to adjust quickly. Uh, doing things that I never thought possible with software because um, I was good at writing software, but my, maybe not always great at math. And I don't have a PhD in, well, I don't have a PhD in anything. Um, <laughs> that's kind of the point. I don't need a PhD to do speech to text. I don't need a PhD to do things like computer vision. We're going to show you some of those which are really cool. But that's the point is just really taking your app and make it, taking it to the next level with some of these really hardcore technologies that, that we can unlock very easily. 
uh, where it's, it's simply a REST call instead of a big algorithm that you have to design. Uh, also, getting knowledge to the right spots, right? Being able to sift through a bunch of knowledge quickly and efficiently, not in, a, in a, like a search way, but more in an entity lookup kind of way where you're associating different entities and you can do things like see what the sediment of that knowledge is, see, what this, see where these things meet together. And we'll talk about some of the products around that. But this, this is really cool for me um, because I think this is where a lot of our applications that we're talking about are going. Last one here. This is kind of like our. I'm about tripped on that. That would have been awesome. It would have been a best presentation ever. Um, and I've had some good ones. I actually had a, a presentation. We have uh, one of our uh, directors uh, who runs um, Cognitive Services at Microsoft. It happens to be from Argentina. And I went to Argentina to present at our uh, data and AI days down there. And he went on before me and he talked about Cognitive Services all in Spanish. So I'm like, get up behind behind him just going, I'm, this, this is not going to be as good as that one. So if I fell, it would have been fine. Um, so business processes, we think about this as like, we call it RPA, so robotic process automation. This is like, this is awesome for me too, because think about the volume that you do with things and really how you can uh, automate different processes in the back end of your systems. So this is, you might not even have a human interacting with these systems. This might just be AI being infused in it, so using machine learning. Uh, we had a manufacturing company that I worked with recently. <coughs> They're using computer uh, vision, basically our custom vision module in cognitive services to take pictures of their manufacturing line. They are very, very custom shop, and they there's spots along the line where they're supposed to put clips on the trucks that they're manufacturing. And if they don't put it on, they cost a bunch of money to put it on later because they missed it. So they just take a picture compare it to their model and say, hey, it's missing or it's there. And so that's a, a really simple way of kind of infusing some of this AI into the processes. And where a human had to do it before, you actually are saving a lot of money from that, that point. So the point is, I'll get into some of the a little bit deeper technology, but this is some of the trends that we're seeing. And it's really an important aspect of where I see the software development market really going and as a developer this is really exciting for me because it used to be where <clears throat> if you were going to build a software application a lot of times you'd have to build what I like and does let's say I wanted to build a window in a house I'd have to build the entire house before I got to the window and so now with with our DevOps and with AI and with the cloud, all these systems that we can build on top of, that's kind of one of the concepts here too, is being able to do really these building blocks along the way to build these systems that are very scalable, very smart, very easy to change, easy to deploy. That's really the idea here. So it's a great time to be a software engineer um, and really be able to be in a marketplace to really address your customer needs quickly. And I think that's the other thing too, is that instead of having to build all those systems, um, you really can focus on what's important in that system for your customers. And that's really one of the powers that we were kind of unlocking there. So we'll talk about a little bit more about just the platform itself, um, just some of the things that we have there. I talked about the building block approach. So at the top here, these are some of the things we're going to talk about right now, just the bot service, the cognitive services side. But behind it, Keep in mind, the cognitive services side, and we'll talk more about it in, in a sec, that really is basically unlocking a lot of the stuff underneath there. And so as a developer, I might not need to know all the, the machine learning algorithms or deep learning algorithms, but I have those if I need to. So as customers, like the manufacturing company that I mentioned, if the custom vision isn't quite working out for them, they might be able to bring in a data scientist to use our machine learning platform to get even deeper into it so it works better for them specifically. We see that quite a bit. These guys are pretty awesome too, being able to actually push down these models to things like TensorFlow and CoreLML. You can actually take that same custom vision model that I had and put it on your phone and put it on a Mac, put it on an Android phone, uh, those kind of things where you can actually start doing things in the edge. And that's kind of where I see things going as well is these really hardcore algorithms are actually gonna push down to the edge and so you, can, you don't even have to touch the cloud to get to it. So we'll get into more of the, the top two there. So let's talk about bots. I always like, 
I'm not a big fan of just doing straight slideshows. So I'm going to stop for a second. <coughs> I'm going to grab my teams here. You see that? Good. Uh, Ryan, you're in the way. Still see that? Okay, so one of the bots that I like to kind of reference um, comes from uh, Microsoft's big company. Um, we have a lot of people. Sometimes I get emails from people, and I'm like, who that person is, and I need to figure out who they are because they're asking me something very hard. And so I'll have to. We had a website out there, and it's been around a long time. It's called Doctor Whom. Because we're geeks. Um, so what we do in Doctor Whom is we type in things like. Who's, my, who's this guy's manager? Type in his name and you'd show him the whole work chart and you'd be able to kind of navigate around there. So this is the whole idea behind this WhoBot. Now the difference between WhoBot and Dr. Whom is very awesome. We have these couple pillars of AI that we're putting things into. One of the big pillars that we're doing in Microsoft is we're putting into our Office products, right? So our Microsoft Graph, what it does in Office 365 is it basically keeps track of some of the interactions that you're having and some of the things you're posting and your calendar and your email. And if I go in, this is in my contact, so I'm all logged in here. So it's using my information from Graph. So I can figure out things like, I always think this is a funny one. Who is my manager? It changes a lot. <laughs> And actually, is that cool? It actually asked me to make sure I'm allowing it to log in. So now I know it's my information. So John Yoakum indeed is my manager. But what about this? Let's say, who is Ryan? There's a few Ryans in Microsoft. Ryan Berry, Ryan McIntyre, Ryan Zeller. So these guys are actually the people I know as Ryan. These are the people I have the most interaction with. I just had a meeting with Ryan Berry on Friday, so it makes sense that he's the first one that pops up. Uh, actually, Ryan's in the room, so they were actually checking to make sure Ryan's in the room. Just, no, I'm just kidding. No, it's a little funny. The alphabetical food. Yeah, so let's do this. Um, oh, wait, Z is last. No. Okay. <clears throat> That's all fine, right? But how about this? Who did I email about bots? I always like this too. If you notice, he's typing. <laughs> That's actually really important. Um, we've been doing these bot workshops all around the world. And the ones that are most exciting, the ones that work the best, actually have human names and kind of human personas. And that's really what you want that kind of almost emotional intelligence as well as that, that real bot intelligence in there. So that emotional intelligence is really important to just have that interaction. So you kind of see, I've emailed these guys. So that's kind of inter interesting because that actually is very, it gives you some productivity beyond just your straight look up on a web page or search on a web page. So I think that's pretty cool. We can do more of those in the calendar and stuff like that, but I'm, I'll stop there just to get an idea. Now, one of the things that we'll talk about, keep in mind, is that this is Teams. This is actually one of our richest channels for our bot framework. And so we'll talk more about what the channels are, but this is one of the advantages for our bot framework is that my channels, and we'll, again, we'll talk more about it in the architecture. My channels are actually where I would do um, basically like Facebook Messenger or Skype for Business or Web Chat, those kind of things. The point is I don't have to change my code for that. Like I can write one set of code and just switch out those channels interchangeably. Maybe I have all those channels. The nice thing about that is you can actually use the bot framework to kind of reach to your customers where they're going to be instead of having to write additional pieces. I'm a, again, a developer. Uh, I heard once that laziness breeds ingenuity. As a developer, I can relate to that. So I want to make sure that I can only have that one set of code, something I'm really good at, and let somebody else handle the channel part of it. Okay. Let's jump back over. That's scary. So this is our bot framework, so explosive growth on it. We have just a ton of bots that are going into it, and it's maturing. It's almost uh, up to the fourth rev of it. I think they're going to release the uh, SDK4 at build, which is in just a few weeks. So I hope they're done. 
Um, just some of the interactions that we've seen with bots. So <clears throat> information retrieval. You saw what we were doing with who. I'm not going to belabor all that, but that's a really good way of kind of gathering information about things. We always get the, what's the weather? What's the weather in Dallas? What's, you know, that, that kind of bot. Transactional. Um, this could be both internal and external transactions. One of the, my favorite ones that we've had that we've developed is, is one that's not quite in production yet, but it was for a big airline. And what they did, what they're doing is they basically are using, um, they wanted a Facebook Messenger bot to do basically group trips. And so let's say that we're gonna go play golf together in Las Vegas, because that's what we do in Vegas, play golf. Um, and we want to meet and we're coming from several different cities. Uh, you basically use this bot in a group conversation to basically say, I'm going to add these couple, three guys. We have different desk or different origins, but one destination. So the bots and they're basically looking up flights for us and basically tying it into where we want to go. So it's a really good way of kind of using the channel as something that's, that's kind of compelling to the customer and not just, you can, obviously you can buy tickets on your phone. You can buy tickets on the web page, you can buy tickets all on the, anywhere you want it. But this is another way of kind of using the channel to help with that. Next one is advisory role, really looking at like pulling in expert systems. So um, like doing lookups on knowledge bases, had a lot of customers use it for their uh, call center lookups. So uh, the call center, we, we actually have call center agents using the bot. So you're still getting like kind of human interaction, but you're using the bot to actually go out and look for the information, which is kind of cool because you, you, can, you can still have that human that's uh, kind of fielding it, but you can get the information still quick. This is the funniest one for me, the social conversations. Um, I was in Las Vegas at a, uh, one of our internal conferences and we were going, we had another, so we had a week in Vegas and a week in uh, Redmond. And basically we had to fly between there on a Friday. So my buddy who uh, does a lot of bots with me and does a lot of these workshops with me was sitting behind me on the airplane. And he's like, hey, check this out. And he hands me his phone and he's interacting um, with this, what I thought at the time was a girl named Zoe. I'm like, dude, that's not right. You're married. That's, you shouldn't be talking to somebody from Las Vegas. He's like, Kevin, it's a bot. I'm like, oh, well, that's weird too. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, this is really interesting though because we've actually have uh, a couple bots, like one in China and one in Japan. It's got a ton of subscribers. And Zoe, so Zo.ai, you can guys can go out there to that right now and basically you can start a conversation with Zoe. Now Zoe has got a lot going on in terms of what you can do with the interactions. Um, hopefully, uh, yeah, just go check it out. It's really interesting on all that you can do with it. I, I like mentioning Tay. So Tay was another bot that came before Zoe. She's the one that got hacked and started being a racist, which is not good. Um, what happened with Tay was basically they were using um, social media interactions on Twitter to help with conversation. So they figured it out and started basically peppering that social media conversation with some bad stuff. So Zoe doesn't have that. Uh, not to say I've tried it, but um, she usually shuts down pretty quick. They can start doing that kind of stuff. So that's kind of the three, the four categories. Um, so what are some of the other things that we see with bots? Um, these are just some of the things I've seen along the way in terms of the different markets that we've approached. These are actually, every one of these is one of customers of mine that have built bots and they're running or are in um, getting ready to run. So kind of cool, some of the ones. The, the medical one, the thing appointments make sense. The one that terrified me was the initial triage. In fact, we have like internal uh, discussion lists where these guys that have PhDs in like computer vision are sending pictures of like what they wanted to triage. I'm like, I am never looking at this channel again. This is terrifying. I'm like, I, I went into software because I couldn't go into medical. <laughs> um, so that kind of thing is really cool though, be able to actually take a picture of something and, and get a result back. Um, so this is a good one for me, HR productivity. So let's say that I work in the HR department and there's a lot of information that I, that I need to be responsible for. Um, we have a very simple bot that we call Q&A Maker, a very simple uh, application called Q&A Maker. Most people kind of, especially hardcore devs are like, uh, Q and A maker. It's it's really not all that great. It's just basically you put a bunch of questions in, it gives you answers. I mean that's cool and all, but it's it's kind of simple. Well, let's think about that HR person. Maybe 
they have to answer the same question five times a day. And after five days a week, that's 25 times of the same question. And you could see right away where a bot makes sense because the first interaction or the second or third or fifth interaction on a Monday is not going to be the same customer uh, satisfaction as the one on Thursday, as the one on Friday. If you have to answer the same question over and over again, I have four kids. I totally get this. I have those questions peppered all the time. After the fourth or five, fifth time of the same question, I'm usually out of my mind. So I can't imagine the patience that somebody has with HR having to answer those questions. I think the same thing with like the IT automation, actually doing customer uh, like password resets. You can understand that. Thankfully, we have a self-service thing in Microsoft. Otherwise, we'd be pe peppering that poor guy. So, so those are kind of the internal ones. Those are really important. Um, I hope you guys noticed over here on the right. Helicopter configuration, Kevin? Are you sure about that? Yeah, I actually had a... <laughs> had a customer that did, um, they had a basically an API layer that did a lot of their configurations for helicopters. They sell basically both commercial and kind of um, private helicopters, if you will. And we tied a bot into it and they, they named it Heli and they walk you through all the steps and basically build a, a, a um, helicopter. And they, I never forget the CEO we were presenting to her and she's like, it took us about five months of designing the front end of this. And you're telling me in like three days, you guys knocked out a bot that did the same thing? I'm like, is that good? Yes. I'm, oh, yes. Yes, we did. But it, it turned out really good. So kind of cool. They're just different things that you can use it for. So let's talk about some of the technology behind it. So I always love hearing, hey, could you send me the uh, architecture diagram for a bot? Uh, this is it. This is my slide for it. It's pretty simple. Uh, basically, we have the channels on the front end. We have this bot connector service. This is really important. This is actually the big thing that runs in Azure and does routing between the channels and your code. And then finally, we have our code in the back end. So if you stop there, you'd say, well, it's a useful bot, but maybe not a very smart bot. It doesn't have a lot of AI uh, hooked up to it. You could put some other AI part of it to make it smarter. So that's where this AI resources come from. But Again, think about that that building block of the platform. So you can build a lot of other stuff in other stuff into this. But this is basically the Bart architecture. So let's talk about each piece of this. Well, the first one is really the bot connection service. That's that middle uh, layer. What this does is really it does registration. So this is where you register your bots. This service runs in Azure. It does all the uh, basically routing between the channels and the back end from the back end to the channels. That's the biggest thing. Um, it does some authentication. It's really the authentication between channels to the bot and back and forth. Um, we can still build in authentication to these channels and building authentication to the bot code itself. So there's a lot that we can do around that. Um, it used to do state management too, but we actually moved that out. So instead of having a shared state that we were doing, we're actually putting that into whatever state you want to bring with you. So usually that's like our table storage or Cosmos DB. That's Channels, I mentioned this. This is where I basically I write one piece of code and I don't have to write each one of these channels. So some of the exciting ones here, Teams, um, Skype Business, Slack, Twilio, doing text messaging, uh, Facebook Messenger. This one over here on the right is our direct line. So this is the kind of the, the nicest one in my mind in terms of how you can customize a bot. So direct line, what it does is basically gives you a REST-based interface to that bot. So a lot of times we'll see people use this as something that you can do custom code against. So if you have your own application, you want to talk to the bot, and that doesn't work, any of those don't work for you, you can just write your own. So it's kind of a nice way. That's one of the ones that we've actually used. Um, we have like an Alexa bridge, so you can actually talk to Alexa and talk to our bot framework that way. Uh, the one I don't have on here is Cortana as well. OK, so here we go. We're going to. We're going to go off the, the rails here. <laughs> Anytime we do a Cortana demo, I get scared because when you're presenting, you have to give it the exact same the, uh, the thing I put in there for the question. Bear with me. Come on, Cortana. I'm, not, I'm clicking the microphone. It's still not even working. That's funny. Demo gods. 
<laughs> okay, here we go. Hey, Court. Hey, Cortana. Oh, I know. Okay. Hey, Cortana, ask Virgil, what is the bot framework? It's working. She's connected. Skype. Skype for business. Email. She William, heard me a little bit. She asked me what the Bing, channels were. Cortana, but. Kick, group me. Facebook Messenger, direct line. So the point here is that no, she's going to yell at me in a minute. The point is that I can actually write the same amount of code. Yeah, I know. I got you. Um, and I can connect it up to Cortana. I can use it from Windows. Um, I could use it from my uh, iOS device, my uh, Android device with Cortana. And it's nice because she connects out to my bot. You can have actually multiple bots as well. The Ask Virgil was the invocation name for Cortana. So we'll show you a little bit more on what that looks like in just a second. I'm glad it actually worked. <laughs> it happens. So, okay, the bot builder, this is really your code. The nice thing about this is that you get basically the ability to um, really customize. This is your application, right? So you're not worried about the front end. You're not worried about the all the channer, channels and the scaling of the channels, that kind of thing. This is where your code lives. And so the cool thing about this, from my perspective, from a de developer perspective, is that this is like web API. This looks like MVC. Um, we do support um, Node and uh, C Sharp as our kind of two SDKs right now, but you can just do a REST-based language as well, and you can basically write in anything. We do, we're going to have in the um, SDK 4, I believe we're adding Python to that, and I'm not sure the other ones, but the point is that there's a lot that you can do around the REST-based interface, and it's fairly straightforward, fairly simple. Um, when you're hosting this, we have a couple options inside Azure, but really if it has this bot has an externally facing IP address, you can host it pretty much anywhere. So I've actually hosted these guys in like a service fabric um, microservice. We've hosted it in, in a uh, Kubernetes container. So it's really flexible in that way. The two ways out of the box, and I'm going to show you one of them in just a second to provision it. Uh, two ways out of the box is really our app service plan and our functions. So from a bot perspective, they operate pretty much the same way, but really it's how you pay for it, right? So the app service plan, you're paying for your resources all the time, so they're available all the time. Uh, and then from the functions, it's basically on a first kind of consumption basis. So as soon as you get called out there, the bot is obviously chatty, pun intended. And so this is a good way of kind of paying for it. And both of them, both of those work really well. They have really nice interaction in the portal to show you that. Okay, last couple slides on bots, and we'll jump over to our cog services. Um, I want to just talk about our cards. So the bot is really not meant to just be text-based. Sometimes if you pick a channel like text, obviously it will be text-based. But the, the idea is that it's really meant to be a lot more than that from adaptive card uh, ability. So I'll show you some of those in just a second. But you saw actually in the Teams one, we had the picture of my boss, and then you had a bunch of options underneath that. Those are cards. And so you could do a lot with from the interaction point of view to make it real rich. So last two things here. So this is just a more overview on the, the framework. And then I mentioned if you just write a bot by itself, it's kind of a, it's just an application, right? It's kind of a dumb bot. Um, this is the stuff that we're going to use to make the bot a lot smarter and make the bot a lot more extensible. This is the AI tenants that we're going to use. So let's talk about the first one here. I've already mentioned Q&A Maker. So this is basically being able to actually use um, question and answers. This uses NLP for those question and answers as well. So I can just point it at a fact page and download that information, and my bot can use it right away. The nice thing about that is it's not a case statement. It's not a database lookup. It's actually using a lot of kind of interaction there to make sure that you get to the question you need. And you can tune it over time as well. And then finally, our Lewis um, side of it. So Lewis stands for uh, Language Understanding Intelligence Service. It's part of our cognitive services. This is where you can really, I'm going to show it. So you guys can see it a little bit. So 
So if I go to Lewis.ai, what this does is basically translates what my users are talking about into commands for my bot to use. So essentially, those are what we call utterances and intents. So the intent is like a verb. The utterances is all the different ways I can say that verb. So uh, what's the weather in Dallas? Well, we're talking about weather, right? So the utterance is what's the weather in Dallas? Uh, weather is going to show me where I'm going to go. Dallas is actually an entity inside there. So I can pull that out and use it to program against. So let's do that real quick. So you could you can imagine there's a lot of ways that we can use this. Let me grab one that has. I'll use the one that I was using for uh, my Virgil bot. So we have two different ways you can talk to the Virgil bot. You can talk to him about uh, bots, and you can talk to him about cognitive services. You can always also talk to him about a couple other things, like uh, you know, say hi to him, um, yell at him, get negative with him. That's a lot of bots actually have that. Uh, they have that negative sentiment. So they you can not only use uh, our cognitive services to see if the sediment is declining, but you can also use like negative intents to see if they're actually getting mad. And you can say, oh, you know, I'm sorry that the interaction isn't proving fruitful for you. We, let me hand you off to a person or let me push you off to a website or something like that. So that's what we do there. So in this, here's our, uh, basically, let me create one of these. So here's our body information. This is the intent, that's our verb. And then down below, you can see all the different utterances that you can see in there. So what are the best channels for images? All those are, these are ways that we are interacting with the bot. Yeah. Yeah. Wait, uh, the sandwiches are, are leaving? If anybody wants an extra sandwich before they take off, take a show of hands and I'll grab a bunch of them inside. That's all the sandwiches you need? Five, six, seven. <laughs> all right. So that's Lewis. Um, and actually, if you notice with the Teams bot, we're actually the Who bot. We're using Lewis to actually distill what information we're trying to get to. So what is my manager? Manager is going to be like an intent. Um, who did I interact with? That's going to be like an email lookup. Who did I, who knows about? So knows about is going to be another intent. Those are the different ways. So it's, it's a nice way of kind of opening up without using a menu-driven approach. The other thing that we very, very much caution our users against is that you don't really want to have, you're not building Siri, <laughs> Cortana, or Alexa in your bot. So having endless amount, when, anytime I hear one of the developers say, hey, what's the max amount of intense you can do in Lewis? I'm like, hey, don't build Cortana. <laughs> and so I think this is an important aspect of it. Be very specific about you know how you're actually going to have a business case around this. So. I think we need to see more bots. So I have a list of bots here. We've already seen Virgil a little bit. So let's grab, let's grab a poll. Let's go good news bot. So this, this bot's kind of funny. Um, I was presenting to all of our US um, sales team in Las Vegas. And I wanted a good demo, so this is basically going to show us the news, going to show us some carousel stuff, really cool. And one of my buddies who was helping me write, write, write it, I was testing it out right before it went on, and we actually had the news. And unfortunately, the news, uh, very negative. Uh, it was like getting ready to go on stage about 10 minutes out. I'm like, pull it up. I'm like, okay, here's the news. Murder, murder, murder. Like, Oh, we got to do something else, man. This is a really <laughs> negative intent or negative sentiment. So we use uh, sports, which not always the best, but this one's kind of cool because it actually does give you uh, that 77% is based on a sediment running across the news article or the headline. So you can kind of get an idea there. Cool thing here is that we're actually using the cards as well. So you can kind of see up here that you can scroll across. This is a, a nice way of kind of showing some of the things that you can do around the bots. Um, you can also do the query knowledge base, so I can do something like, we actually have it pointed to like a product key or a product facts for Windows. So I can say like, what is my product? Or I should say where, it doesn't really matter. Where? 
where's my product key? But I also do like product key. Just make it all misspelled. Notice it's all wacky in the way I spelled it. I got the same result though. The kite, the thing that we want to show there is that we actually didn't load those in by hand. We actually just pointed it out a fact page and downloaded all the stuff for us. And then it does a pretty good job of, of doing NLP to understand what you're kind of asking for, which is good for your users. So, I mean, those are the kind of bots you can spin up really quick for your users, uh, internal and external, to kind of get the information out. Okay, so let's do this. I think I have about 15 minutes. Do I have 15 minutes? What's my time? He's got an agenda. Is a break at 2 10. Yeah. What? 10 minutes. Oh, yeah, you're running on borrowed time. Yeah. I'm already over. Hey, you're already over. Keep going. <laughs> okay, we're going to do this then. We're going to switch gears and we're going to do cognitive services real quick. There's an app in on iOS. Um, called CNAI. I want you all to go check it out. And what we did was we have a, a gentleman who works for us who um, is visually impaired. And this application was really written around people that are visually impaired. And it does a lot of stuff. You have to check it out for me. So let's do a couple things that it does here. The reason why I use it is because it uses all of our cognitive services. So it, it's a good way of kind of showing what our cognitive services do. So person's a good one. I'm gonna do myself first. Close. It's a little old, I just turned 40. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you laugh, I'm gonna turn it on you. Yeah, I'm <laughs> Four people detected 46 year old woman with brown hair looking happy, 38 year old man wearing a hat and glasses looking neutral, 30 year old man. So, kind of cool. They're, the way they were using it there was that. Um, the guy who is kind of demoing it from a um, scene perspective is that a lot of times you don't know the interaction. And so he actually runs them on his glasses, these pivot head glasses, and he can just swipe the side of them and kind of get a read of the crowd, which is cool. Uh, let's see. I borrow one of your pieces of paper there. So how about a document? Let's do like, oh, there's handwriting even better. Top handwriting preview. I don't know what that says. Just, just trying to read. Oh yeah, so it picked up a lot. It actually picked up the text instead of just the handwriting. It actually did pick up the swagger down at the bottom there. Too. Okay, okay. Uh, color. This is kind of cool. So. The cool thing for me is that, let me just show you one other thing here. If you go to our cognitive services, you do Azure and search for cognitive services, it'll take you to this page. I want to show you a couple things that you can do here. Um, let's do the, let's do that. So face API, this is one where you basically are verifying two faces are the same kind of face. That's not exciting. This is the one that's exciting. So let's just pick up. Uh, there we go. There's a bunch of me and a few of my colleagues uh, standing next to a wall in Ireland. So notice. So over here you have the it's still 46. Um, this is called, this is the idea though. You basically just make a call, a rest call, and this is the stuff you get back. Now it's not just the stuff we just talked about. It's actually a lot more than that. So check it out. You have. Whether I'm bald or not, I am not bald. That's a good thing. Um, I don't know about invisible. Uh, brown, black, gray hair, blonde hair, other red hair. Smile, if I'm smiling or not. How my head is actually uh, facing. This is amazing, right? Um, what my gender is, the wrong age that it gives me. <laughs> if I have a mustache and a beard, that's cool. It doesn't have that. Glasses, if I'm wearing eye makeup. I'm not judging, it's fine. Uh, lip makeup, and then my emotion there, so happiness is 100%. Uh, 
um, and, and, and so forth and so on. So you can imagine all the applications that you write with that. Like we've had it where one of the demos that we have is um, called Intelligent Kiosk. Please check it out. And it's, it's uh, on GitHub. And basically what it does, you can simulate somebody right, uh, basically driving, and if they're distracted, because you can see their head move. So very cool way of doing that. Um, we've had it where we did a, uh, just a real brief POC over in the airport. We're basically doing timing between point A and point B of the security line to see how long it takes in the security line. So all we were doing is matching faces from the beginning of the security line to the end of the security line to see how long it took. So those are really cool ways of kind of demonstrating this technology. Um, and there's a lot more to it. One more and then I'll be done, I promise you. Very excited about this one. Who likes bourbon? There's a few. So I have a... Bourbon. Bourbon identifier. What I found was that not every, every people like bourbon, but they don't aren't always know what bourbon you're talking about. So my idea with this bot was I take a picture in a bar, so I don't have to ask the waitress every time. Because the waitress is like, what kind of bourbons you got? And they're like, Maker's Mark? I don't know. Do you have a list? No. I guess I'm getting Maker's Mark tonight. Usually I get up and walk over and, and look at the bar. So this is the idea behind this. Is this is using custom vision. So I've loaded a thousand bourbon bottles into a vision model. I didn't actually go out there and put them on there by hand. I actually used the, the API for Bing search to load it. And what it will do is I can basically load a picture of a bourbon bottle. It'll run against the model and it'll say which one it thinks it is. And that is indeed a bottle of Booker's, 78%, which is good. Let's do another one. Booker's is only in there 50 times, so that's actually pretty good. It's actually picking across a lot of. So if you if you narrowed the scope to say I have a thousand pictures of like Booker's, and then anything that came in, I could tell you if it was Booker's or not, almost 100 times, right? 100 percent of the time. So let's do another one. Um, uh, Blanton's, very good bourbon. Oh, look at that, 94 percent. So this is that custom vision model that I talked about. Really cool way of kind of using this. Here's a bullet. <clears throat> a little bit low. I Again, it depends on how you're building your model. I think that's really the key here. But once you get it and you kind of build it out, you can really iterate on it. I think I'm on like the 23rd iteration of that model, which is kind of cool. So you can really kind of fine tune it to make sure that you're getting. This is what we use for that manufacturing plan to make sure that we're getting clip, no clip. And the environment that we're pulling across is really not an easy one to look at. So, all right, yeah, go ahead. Could you use this when you interview people, see if they're lying? Since you <laughs> a certain look on their face wow. when they're lying, right? Where are you going? I don't know. I don't know how to answer that one. Um, <laughs> now it's funny. We actually did have a bot that was it's similar to the bourbon bot, where you actually walk through and it shows menus. So it's like. What are you drinking tonight? What kind of bourbon do you like? How much do you want to spend? Well, my boss saw that first thing. He's like, oh, you have to make sure we can upload my picture and see if I should stop drinking or not. So he actually used emotion detection on that one and said, you look a little too happy. You need to slow down. Or you look really mad. Stop drinking or drink more. I don't know which one. So that's my point. So if you guys want more, please uh, connect with me. We have a lot of code behind this. These are all samples you guys can grab. I didn't get into the how to provision it and stuff like that. I apologize for running out of time. Uh, thank you, though.